Hi, my name is Zach Litke, and this is the Bordetella pertussis presentation. You're going to see Chantel Hammond in a bit, as well as Kylie Loving. Um, kind of go ahead and start a screen share and begin. So Bordetella pertussis is the, um, it's whooping cough. You know, it's a rough disease for adults and uh, it's pretty horrible for children. This particular bacterium is gram negative, meaning that it has an outer membrane, a thin peptidoglycan layer, and a cell membrane in that order. The shape is cocobacillus, which you can see in these photos off to the right. The top photo is what you'd see under a light microscope, and the bottom is a similar image viewed under an electron microscope. This is a non-motile and non-spore forming bacterium. It does have a capsule, which helps it to be protected from harsh environments. And it's also aerobic, meaning that it needs oxygen to survive. The reservoir for pertussis is humans, mostly uh, children. The interesting thing is that this particular disease is only found in humans. With that being said, it stands to reason that we could effectively eradicate Bordetella pertussis from the human population, much like we did with smallpox in 1979, according to the World Health Organization. The image you see here on the right is of a nasopharyngeal swab that has been grown on horse blood auger. There are several different medias that could be used to grow Bordetella pertussis on. Bordet Gengau auger is the auger that is best suited for the job, though horse blood auger and charcoal blood auger will work as well. All right, my name is Chantal Hammond, and I'm going to be sharing information on the signs and symptoms of Bordetella pertussis, as well as the transmission of Bordetella pertussis. All right. When discussing the signs and symptoms of Bordetella pertussis, it's important to know the difference between the two. A sign is any objective evidence of a disease as noted by an observer. A good way to distinguish a sign from a symptom is by asking, can this be seen? Signs of Bordetella pertussis include an initial minor cough, minor fever, severe coughing fits, usually violent and rapid continual coughing followed by a whooping gasp for air beginning one to two weeks after the initial cough, apnea in infants, and coughing induced vomiting. Keep in mind that all these signs can be observed by someone other than the patient. A symptom is the subjective evidence of a disease as sensed by the patient. A good way to distinguish a symptom is by asking, can this be seen or only felt? Being that symptoms are what the patient alone can experience, these are usually used as additional information during the diagnosis on top of the ob observable signs. Some of the most common symptoms of Bordetella pertussis include nasal congestion, exhaustion, and malaise. Uh, in general, signs are more precise than symptoms, though both can have the same underlying cause. This chart illustrates the stages of progression displayed by Bordetella pertussis. As you can see, it has an incubation period of five to 10 days, which is the time from the exposure to the onset of symptoms. The onset, onset of symptoms marks the beginning of the communicable period which lasts for roughly three weeks. The communicable period is divided into two stages. The cateral stage, which is the first two weeks after the appearance of signs and symptoms, during which those signs and symptoms are minor, like a minor cough. The last half of the communicable stage, uh, uh, sorry, the communicable period is the proximal stage, which, um, is displayed by an increase of intensity of signs and symptoms. This stage can last anywhere from one to six weeks. 
the final stage of this disease is the convulsant stage. This stage is the gradual lessening of signs and symptoms, and it can last as little as a few weeks or as long as months. This video clip will give you a better idea of what pertussis sounds like. Note the whooping gasps for air in between coughing pits. This would be what displayed during the proximal stage. All right, let's talk about transmission. Um, the transmission of whooping cough and bordetella pertussis. Uh, whooping cough is highly contagious and is spread among people by direct contact with fluids from the nose or mouth of infected people. It is spread only from person to person. This can be done in any number of ways from sharing a drink to inhaling the small bacteria containing droplets propelled into the air by a cough or sneeze. Um, people could contaminate their hands with respiratory secretions from an infected person and then touch their own mouth or nose. Due to the intimate nature of the transmission of Bordetella pertussis, it's fairly common for infants to be infected by a parent, sibling, or caregiver who might be unaware they have the illness. Hi, I'm Kylie Loving, and I'm going to be talking to you today about prevention and treatment of pertussis. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here with you. All right, so the best way to prevent pertussis is to get vaccinated. There are vaccines for infants, children, preteens, teens, and adults. The childhood vaccine is called DTAP, and the pertussis booster vaccine for adolescents and adults is called TDAP. In both vaccinations, the D is for diphtheria, the T is for tetanus, the P is for pertussis, and the A is for acellular, which means only a part of the pertussis organism is used in the vaccine. Uppercase letters in DTAP indicate full strength doses of diphtheria and tetanus and tetanus toxoids and the pertussis vaccine. Lowercase d and p and tdap indicate reduced doses of diphtheria and pertussis used in that vaccine. Children should get five doses of DTAP at ages two, four, and six months, 15 through 18 months, and four through six years. The tdap booster should be given to adolescents 11 through 18 years of age, preferably around the age of 11, and one dose of Tdap or TDAP is also recommended for adults, um, adults 19 years of age and older who did not get uh, TDAP as an adolescent. Expectant mothers should receive Tdap during each pregnancy, preferably at 27 through 36 weeks. Then babies will be born with circulating antibodies. Acellular pertussis vaccines contain inactive pertussis toxin and may contain one or more other bacterial components. Pertussin toxin is detoxified either by treatment with a chemical or by using molecular genetic techniques. If a person has pertussis, the sooner treatment is started, the better. Suspected and confirmed cases should be treated promptly because treatment is ineffective if started once symptoms present themselves. The rec recommended antimicrobial agents for the treatment of pertussis are erythromycin, clarithromycin, and azithromycin. Pertussis is spread by coughing and sneezing while in close contact with others, who then breathe in the pertussis bacteria. Practicing good hygiene will help prevent spread. Proper hygiene practices include covering your mouth and nose when you sneeze and proper hand washing techniques. Pertussis has been in the news recently. In a study published in the Journal of Pediatrics on May 4, 2015, it was reported that the effecti effectiveness of the Tdap vaccine has been waning. For adolescents who received all their shots, effectiveness within one year of the final booster was 73%. The effectiveness rate plummeted to 34% within two to four years. Pertussis outbreaks have been reported in many states, and the number of pertussis cases are on the rise. 
During 2012, 48,277 cases of pertussis were reported to the CDC, including 20 pertussis-related deaths. The majority of deaths occurred among infants younger than three months of age. The incidence rate of pertussis among infants exceeded that of all other age groups. It was not uncommon for the number of reported pertussis cases before the vaccine was introduced in the U.S. during the mid-1940s to be close to 200,000 cases per year, as was the case in 1935, where you can see it was 180,000. After the vaccine was introduced, those numbers declined steadily until they hit an all-time low in 1976 at 1,010. But since the 1990s, those numbers have been on, been on the rise and the use of the acellular pertussis vaccine may be to blame. According to the CDC, the acellular pertussis vaccine, DTAP, that we, um, that we use now may not protect us for as long as the whole cell vaccine, DTP, that we used to use. During the 1990s, the U.S. switched from using DTP to using DTAP for infants and children. Whole cell vaccines are associated with an increased rate of side effects, such as fever and pain and swelling at the injection site. There are also reports of rare but serious neurological adverse reactions, including chronic neurological problems among children who had received whole cell vaccines. The studies conducted about the link between DTP vaccine and neurological problems have, a, have been inconclusive, but public concern in the US and other countries led to a switch in practice from using DTP to, D to DTAP. We hope that our presentation has been informative for you and that you learned a little bit more about pertussis and we thank you for watching.